beer flavored beer, lots of beer it. flavored beer. All right, we're live. <laughs> Welcome back to the Go Ruck Show. My name's Blaine, and I'm uh, enjoying a beer flavored beer. You guys know who he is. <laughs> All right, so this week our goal is to talk you out of starting a small business or nonprofit, especially a nonprofit. We can get more into that later. Yeah. How do you feel about that advice? Should we just end the show there? <laughs> Don't start a business. Don't do it. So there's actually. That, wait, 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 that's it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, beer. <laughs> Party foul. Party mm -mm, foul. Mm -mm. All right. It all got caught in the rim. None of it spilled. <laughs> so it doesn't count. Yeah. All right. But in all seriousness, there's a lot of well-intentioned and I think generally good emphasis on starting a small business now. Entrepreneurship's the big, the big word. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. At least a lot and a leader. Bit. And you can be both. And so it makes yeah. it, it compounds the awesomeness. You can also be poor, which is cool. Yeah. I mean, so to, to break it here, let me, let me put the benefits up front to you right now. Let me PT Buffett. I have never, since I was in college, I, I, I've never had less money in my bank account than I do right now. So how does that sound? Sounds awesome. Ten, ten years later, go ruck. You know, after the army built up nice little something because deployments were really cheap living on deployment. You know, yeah, if you don't have a family back home. <laughs> to right. So yeah, my wife was working and stuff, so it it, it 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 was good. You know, on the bank account, bad for other stuff, but good on the bank account. And and so yeah, so over the course of the last you know, uh, ten years ago, right now I'd been back from Iraq for a month or something. We were ready to go to, getting ready to go to Africa and make some more big, big money, you know, deployment money. And so, you know, just the bank account just kept going up and up. And now it's, it's never been lower. So to, to be totally fair though, you do own the vast majority of this pretty cool business called Go Ruck, which yeah. while that doesn't, doesn't pay the electric bill every month, like that's still pretty cool, right? Yeah. So look, there's been value creation for, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of risk attached to it. I look, the human still to this day, by the way. Yeah. Like it could course. all be gone tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, look, figuratively. ultimately, people want to start a business. They want to go do something awesome because they want to have more control over their life and because the human spirit burns brightly within Americans. Like, if people want to go out and get after it. That's awesome. It's just what I don't want to have happen for, for more people is doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Because if it's like so many things in life, if, if you go after an outcome, that's, that's where you really get in trouble, right? Oh, I just, I want to be a Green Beret because I'm going to get girls. That's the worst reason in history. You get you a beard and a ball cap. Right? I just want to wear, I, I want to have beards and, and just, you know, I, I can't conform to the army shaving standards. I hate I my first want, sergeant. Yeah, I just want a beard. You know, wrong answer. It's not going to work out for you. You're going to get into some dark place in the middle of Camp McCall and then you're going to tap out and say, you know what, I just had this awakening and actually I just, I, my, I just really don't want to be a Green Beret, right? It's the same thing, business and love and war and life and all these things, they're all kind of the same. And you sort of learn what you're good at and what you're not and what you're willing to risk and what you're not willing to risk. But ultimately what you need to learn is what you want to do in life. Not, not sort of how you want the world to judge your outcome, right? Because that, that's giving the world too much control. So if you start with a problem, you say, let me solve this problem. That, that's a good place to start. Yep. A bad place to start is, I want to be a millionaire. That's a really bad place to start. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that's a little bit of don't yeah. start it, right? Or is that, or, or Was that too more encouraging? people are like, damn, let, be, me go to, let me go to LegalZoom like you did and just <laughs> put, put the paperwork we in. We should be more discouraging. So, <laughs> One of the things that I like to say is that I, you should spend a lot more time thinking about how you want your life to feel and a lot less time thinking about how you want your life to look. And one of the things that drives me a little crazy, like it's not a, a huge pet peeve, but I think the word entrepreneur- Which means it is. It's, that's me hedging and saying it drives me <laughs> fucking crazy. Um, but I think the word entrepreneur and entrepreneurship, like it, it really does mean something. There's actually sort of a doctrinal definition of that word, which means sort of like taking resources and moving them around and rearranging them to make them more valuable and then selling them and whatever. But I think a lot of people like the feel of that word. They like the feel of being an entrepreneur. Like it's cool now to be one. Whereas, you know, I'll give you a little story about my parents. They, we moved to Florida when I was four and my You're dad- You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, it's been great. Um, <laughs> But my, my dad, when we lived in Missouri, drove a truck. That's, that's what he did for his, for his job. And we moved and he was uh, anticipating getting a job with the same freight line when we moved to Florida. 
But when we, 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 so we took the leap, we moved down, we didn't really have any money, you know, a couple of young kids, and it wasn't really working out the way that he'd planned. But we still had to put, you know, food on the table. So my dad went to a garage sale in our neighborhood and he bought a lawnmower. And then he started cutting grass around the neighborhood for cash so that we could put food on the table. And my mom, who's really good with a sewing machine, put an ad in like the shopping, like the classified section of the newspaper, you know? And she started doing like freelance seamstress work for people repairing dresses and hemming pants and all that so that we could put food on the table. And then the, the truck driving job for years just never really panned out. But, you know, my dad was good at cutting grass and doing landscaping and delivered great customer service. And so people would tell their friends about it. And next thing you know, he was jammed, had all week full of cutting grass. Then he had enough cash to buy a little better lawnmower. And they could cut more grass. And then my mom said, screw the seamstress stuff. I'm going to go out and cut grass with you. And they got a little truck and a little trailer. And then we wrote with, you know, magic marker on pieces of paper and rolled them up with rubber bands. And my dad would drive the truck around through neighborhoods and I would throw these pieces of paper into people's yards. That's, this mm. is called marketing, <laughs> right? And I had a phone number on it, which I highlighted. Every yeah. single one of them with a <laughs> highlighter, right? I'm like seven years old doing this, right? Or six years old. Huh? And people started calling us and we started cutting more grass and my dad started a, a lawn business. And, I could, and then the lawn business grew so much, he started doing pools too. Cause he's like, oh, a lot of people in Florida also have pools. So I was like, I could cut their grass and do their pool. So now we're doing pools. And then they realized the pools are easier than the lawns. So we sold the lawn business, kept doing the pools. And they had a partner buy into the pool business. And then eventually his partner sucked, so he sold him the rest of the business, started his own pool business, did that for about five more years, grew that, and then sold that, and went back to driving a truck. Guess what? That's entrepreneurship right there. Yeah, like, that's hustling. Yeah, my parents, in every sense of the word, by definition, were entrepreneurs. But you know what they never used to describe themselves? Entrepreneur, because they were just small business owners. And they didn't care about kind of what their life looked like or what their title was. They were just trying to put money on the table and make money and, and create value and deliver a good service to customers. And they embraced the lifestyle of being small business owners. So that's just kind of a long story to say, stop calling yourself an entrepreneur if you're just starting a business. I knew I loved your, your parents, but now I really love them. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I learned a lot in those days in, in watching them, but what it told me more than anything else was you gotta start small and move fast and just you know, build it a little bit at a time. And you have to embrace the whole lifestyle that goes along with it. Because look, mowing 105 lawns a week is not a good time in Florida. <laughs> it is not a good time. And by the way, when I was growing it's up, August. we didn't it's have air conditioning in our house, I swear to God. We didn't have AC. <laughs> Eventually, they made enough cash to buy a pool, which almost kind of sort of yeah. made up for the not AC. You're hot jump in the pool, right? Yeah. But I just offer all that to say, look, it's also I don't care. It's also in other water because it's a bath, too, in Florida bath. But yeah, if you're a kid, you get, you get your, clean. Hair, your hair is like straw <laughs> yeah. by the end of the summer. But like... Who cares? You throw a little shampoo, you know, shampoo your hair in, in, the, in the pool, whatever. But I the whole... did that. Really? No. Okay. Well... Uh, my, my parents were <laughs> savages. They just let me have the chlorine shampoo and stuff, you know? Right? But... Anyway. Hey. Whole point being, it's hard. And eventually, it worked out okay, but it was a long slog for seven or eight years or however long they owned those businesses. And they never once were like... You know, they didn't have a signature block on their letterhead where my dad was like, Ron Smith, you know, lawn and pool care, CEO. CEO, comma, entrepreneur, comma, badass, wow. comma, gonna get all the girls, comma, I'm awesome, comma, this yeah. is easy, comma, <laughs> right? No, th he didn't have that. Hashtag. Yeah, no, none of that, because he was too busy working. And that's, if I get a lot of emails from people that have ideas for businesses or they've started a small business or they want to be an entrepreneur and they're like, Hey, can we set up some time to chat a little bit about this, whether it's you know for profit or nonprofit? And I, if I see in their signature block, and, I, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend anybody, but if I see in your signature block, CEO, and you're like a pre-revenue business or certainly a pre-profit business, then I'm, I have to wonder if your head's in the right place, because I, I spent probably four or five years at Team RWB before, and actually my signature block never said anything other than Blaine Smith, my phone number, my email address, and yours is the same way, like. I put founder on mine. Sometimes I get emails back faster that way. I, mean, I, I actually guess added, now, you know. So full disclosure, mine does. Mine says Blaine Smith, Go Ruck, and has my phone number. But if I'm sending a cold email to somebody to like you know business yeah. development related, yeah. I, I inject president underneath my name just so they know that it's just. Or if I get like a real bad hurt feelings report, like somebody's upset, we've screwed mm -hmm. something up, whatever, and it's to a customer that's upset, then I write them back immediately and I I make sure that they know that like hey. 
we care about you. But yeah, I mean, so it reminds me back in the day when Emily, I think that's part of the thing, someone's got to drink Ooh. something, right? Everybody. So <laughs> when Emily, that's two, Ooh. yes, was, was serving in West Africa, she had this great boss, and his thing was never underestimate the power of the United States of America business card, right? Yeah. I mean, when you're serving abroad, it's got its own powers. And so that represents, you know, the, the biggest company in the world, right? Want to yeah. start an awesome company? Go back, go back in time and become the founding fathers. That, <laughs> that'd be pretty awesome, you know? But, you know, business cards and all that stuff, I mean, I remember it kind of, look, I always wanted GoRuck to, to be this sort of combination of New York City and, and Baghdad. That was just where my head was. And I remember back in the day spending so much money on kind of these Mohawk business cards because that was sort of this guy. Mohawk's a paper type of weight or something. Yeah. And they were great, I guess, right? And it was just sort of, you know, because you're going to meet people and that's going to be... And that, I, networking. I, yeah, so I started out thinking that that's how this was going to go, right? You meet the right people and then all of a sudden that person just takes a huge vested interest in you and just, it's easy then. It's like, it's like becoming people, an actress, right? You yeah, just get you discovered, just, you know? You just stand just around, happens. you know, you write, mm -hmm. you, you walk around on the right sidewalk and someone finds you, right? Yeah. Well, if you have the right business card, like an American Psycho, of course, <laughs> right? And you hand it and it's perfect and all that stuff and they marvel at it and then it just snap your fingers and it just happens. And, you know, we've got normal business cards now. They're fine. They're great, you know? Like whenever I get a business card, it usually gets shoved in my wallet, maybe, and then eventually, you know, it winds its way up into some pile of business cards I've collected over the years. I try to send a note out if, if we had an awesome time, a couple of beers maybe, you know? Um, but it's not about that stuff. It's, it's about kind of your willingness to hustle against all odds. That's, that's what it comes down to. And if, yeah. if you hate to fail, if you absolutely hate to fail, like you've never quit anything in your entire life, or if you quit one thing, it was a long time ago and you've done a lot of things since then, I'm barely gonna give you that one, right? If you just hate to fail, that's ultimately, you're gonna maybe f be able to figure it out. It's, it's a lot of hustling though, it's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, I would, I would buttress that against, you have to really, really hate to fail, because I think you and I are very squarely in that category. Like, I tell people all the time, and this just makes me feel better, but I tell people a lot, when I was a kid, I, hated to lose. And then when I became a young man, I loved to win. And now that I'm a grown man, I would like to think that I love to compete. Like I really love to compete, but deep down I still hate to lose. Like and I can't ever fully shake that. But, but I would also say you can't be afraid to fail. That's another big, big thing. Like you have to hate it. You have to hate to lose, hate to fail and be willing to just, you know, and you, and ram you have up to against it. Your entire life. But yeah, but you have it's, to be willing this is business fail. and war. It's the same thing, right? I mean, yeah, I actually loved it when you said business, war, love, and life. Whatever, like it, it feels a little cheesy and poetic, but it's a hundred percent true. If you really want to win in business, you've got to be willing to kind of put it all out there and be willing to lose it all in, in some ways. If love is even more so that way. Like you just can't have a great relationship if you're like hedging a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like no, you got to put your balls out there and be one. You know, if they get crushed, so be it. <laughs> But you can't win, especially with women, like they want you to, you know, give them like your full trust and confidence and be all in. So if you can't push all your chips in the pile, like it's not going to work out. Yeah, they can sniff it out if you're yeah. not, if you're, if you're hedging, eh, the world's, the world can sniff it out if you're hedging, you know, yeah. like you, you cut corners, you cut corners becoming a Green Beret or trying to, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a dark, a dark place at Camp McCall trying to throw your rucksack five feet in front of you. Hacking the vines with your rubber ducky. Hacking the vines, yep. and you just have this, this moment where you say, I just don't want to be a Green Beret, you know? If you cut all the corners, eventually it catches up to you. So, you know, in, in the, the start of GORUCK, I mean, there was this idea for a bag that did not exist. If it would have existed, I don't know, GORUCK probably wouldn't have started, in theory. But it was this bag that would work in New York City and that would work in Baghdad. So you go and it, there's this sort of fashion, it's, it's meant to be beautiful. And beautiful is not a four letter word, artist is not a four letter word, right? I mean, doing artistic things, I mean, go, go read, you want a good reading list book, go read Da Vinci, 
by Isaacson, same guy that wrote the Steve Jobs book. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I mean, that man is awesome. And, you know, he wanted his stuff to be beautiful. I mean, he would, he would sit and criticize Michelangelo because he was too rigid, you know? Not beautiful enough, basically. I mean, Michelangelo is thought of as a pretty good He's artist, decent, I right? heard, yeah. He's decent. You know, he's Not apparently the better at, the sculpt artist, yeah. at sculpture than, than painting, you know? But, you know, so it was meant to be beautiful, and it, and it was meant to be tough. And that didn't exist. And my proof that it still doesn't is I've, I've still never seen any of the Black Hawk, Camelback sort of, you know, that line of, of salt packs. I, I, I don't see them when I go to New York with people walking around New York, ever. You know, well, it's, I mean, about, it's about features. There's always an extra clip, an extra external pocket, an extra whatever. Everywhere. Yeah, and yeah, it I just it. looks it looks overly militarized, and it's, it doesn't fit into the civilian world. And so <laughs> that was the initial value proposition that I was looking to solve for myself as well, because I was transitioning out of the military and wanted to kind of straddle that line. But, you know, then, you know, it, it took a, well, it took that, that course, certainly on the gear, but it took a different course with the events, but you know, you've got to solve a problem. And you, know, you, can, you can go into it and say, I want to be a billionaire, so I want to solve a technology problem. Well, guess what? There's lots of smart people out there that want to solve technology problems too. That's, that's why San Francisco is you know, a, a modern capital of the world, or certainly yeah. one of them, is, is because of those reasons. So it's just more competitive. And nobody, nobody wants to give you a break. There's nobody out there that's just, man, I, I just want this guy to, to, to do really well and make a lot of money. I mean, yeah. you know, unless they're vested somehow. I mean, there are certainly people that will help you, but you're right. There's the stars just aren't going to align for you. You've got to chip away at it a little bit at a time. And, you know, maybe it's because I'm not like a big tech guy. I don't have a background in that. I don't, I don't you know, really even love technology in terms of my personal use. But, and maybe it's just growing up with parents that own a lawn and a, and a pool care business. But... I think one of the biggest opportunities for people out there, especially veterans, is any service industry that can't be easily outsourced or automated, those, those things are gonna have to continue to be a thing for a long, long time. And there are ways to deliver those services to people that are better, that are of higher quality. You, I, I really think, and, and think about it this way, when's the last time you needed a plumber at your house, if you can remember this? Like, you can't call a plumber and get one that day. It's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, so I really think there's huge opportunity. Like, you know, grass is always gonna need to be cut and you can't outsource it to Bangladesh and it's, perhaps someday it will be automated, but it's gonna be hard. You know, pools need yeah. to be cleaned, uh, landscaping needs to be done, plumbing needs to be repaired, electrical wire needs to be run. Like, I just think there's a huge, huge opportunity right now in the not so sexy industries. You don't have to start the next Uber, the next Yelp, I think there's a lot of really smart people out there solving what I would call non-problems. They're just trying to take something that's kind of good and popular, and they're like, well, I could just do that thing a little better, and then poof, I'm a millionaire. Like, I'm not saying that won't work, but I just don't think that's the path to success for most people that are looking to start businesses. I think find a problem, find a pain point for people, and get out there and get it done. I, I know here in Jacksonville Beach after the hurricane, you know, people that needed their shingles repaired, needed a roof, they had a heck of a time getting a roofing company to come out and give them an estimate and, and mm -hmm. fix their roof. So like our friend Brent, you know, just kicked it in, who owns a CrossFit gym, by the way, kicked it into overdrive. A good one. And Lots hired, of them. And yeah, and hired a bunch of people <coughs> and just flipped the switch on the roofing business and was out there hustling business that dude's cards. A hustler. It's awesome. Yeah, he never put his phone down for like four weeks. And he was very, very successful. And you can still, I can look across the street right now. There's still shingles that need to be repaired on the museum across the street because people are still having a hard time ah, getting that's the roof a government. That's, a, that's the government though right there. That's uh, the lowest you know, bitter issue. That's, they're that's having. you know, people aren't living in that, in that, under that roof, so. But I'll tell you, like the gate, the gate on my fence, the house got ripped off in the hurricane. Mm -hmm. And it took like three weeks to get a handyman to come out. And I would have fixed it myself, but I rent the house, so I'm not fixing it myself. <laughs> my landlord's gonna fix that. But it took like three weeks for them to get somebody to come out and do it. So there are places where you can really deliver a service to people and it's not glamorous. But if you're the guy that eventually owns three or four landscaping trucks or three or four roofing crews, like you can build a very successful, very profitable business and make a lot of money, you know, but you're, you're not going to go around to a lot of like panels and wear a sport coat and like be do, having do coffee with that, people though? in do San Francisco. Do you really want that? I mean, I've, 
I don't really want I don't. that. I mean, at least you're not. I, you're I, not I, on the circuit, Jason. I'm gonna be I'm honest. I'm not with you. on the circuit. Of all the veteran entrepreneurs I know, you are on the circuit the least. I'm not on the circuit because I've got a lot of work to do, and I really love our crew here in Jack's Beach. I love my family. I love my wife. I love my dog. Right there, you go, M. Right. <laughs> That's two. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't need to go out and, you know, network like that right now. I mean, there's some other stuff that we're, I mean, we are doing some stuff behind the scenes, trying to tell the tale of rocking a little bit more. Yeah. And that's kind of a strategic parallel or a strategic flank that we think is gonna, gonna make more people's lives better, frankly, by telling that story. So, you know, if that comes about, if, right? If means when. When that comes about, Around I, here my does. best guess is that I'll be on the circuit then. But it's, it's not out just because I want to pass out business cards, you know? It's because there's something real to talk about and there's other work that other people can now do, you know? Yeah. I mean, at, at the very beginning, it was no circuit kind of getting out there and passing out business cards did anything for me. It was a ton of time at at my condo in DC, in front of a computer, on the keyboard, I mean, work. Consistently, I've slept eight hours a night. I've been pretty good about that, except for when leading challenges and stuff like that. But the other 16 hours were, it was work. I probably dreamt about Go Rough too, no doubt, you know? I mean, the times when I wasn't working in those 16 or 17 hours, let's call it, was, was rare. Yeah, so this is where my wife, my wife, <laughs> she reminds me a lot that you know, even when you're not like physically at work, like you almost never stop thinking about it. And she's good at kind of keeping me in check on that. And I'm like, oh, well, I just wasn't as productive today as I wanted to be. I didn't get to two of the things that were on my to-do list. And she's like, you never stop thinking about work. You know that, right? Like you're, you're doing it on the weekends, you're thinking about it, you go have beers with your friends and you're talking about it. Like it's always on your mind. It's always one of those things. But I mean, I, I got, maybe criticized is too strong, but I, it was, it was maybe noticed. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably fair, but I didn't spend a lot of time on the circuit when I was in the nonprofit space relative. I mean, there are a lot of people in that space in particular that spend a lot of time on the circuit. And I don't want to say there's no value in that networking, speaking on panels, you know, going to conferences, symposiums, whatever. There is some value in that. There's some value in being part of the space, being out there. You know, if one of your partner organizations throws a thing for you to show up, like there's definitely value, but I did the least of it. I would say of any of the leaders of organizations that were kind of in our cohort or in the same size. Um, I just really tried to pick my spots and be strategic and go to the ones that really mattered and support the ones I thought were really kind of high impact. And then I was going to be in Tampa. If you needed me, I would be in Tampa at my desk, at the office, mm -hmm. at the gym, do, doing the work. And I think that was the best thing that I could have possibly done because two and three and four years later, when I would go to these things, I had something to talk about. I had really something to offer. And I could speak on a panel, or I could be at a conference, and I could meaningfully contribute to the overall kind of convening rather than just be the person running around with my business card <coughs> trying to like, you know, gain attention for what we're doing. So I think there is a place for that, but if I had to guess, I would say most entrepreneurs, most kind of startup business owners spend a disproportionate amount of time at these meetups, you know, conferences, things, and maybe not quite enough time running their business and, and talking to their customers. Because that's, that's who you need to talk to, I mean, is your customers. Yeah, I mean, asking someone how to do something. Like, you know, I can go read a book on Abraham Lincoln about leadership and stuff, and that's great. But that doesn't make me a leader, right? You have to actually get out and do stuff. And so if you want to start a business and you've been talking about it forever, I mean, I don't know, either do it or don't do it. Really, it, it just boils down to that. If you do it, then just realize, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. That's the deal. So, you know, you, it, it's, it's a commitment to hustling. Your go right cadre was coming out a little it, bit it's there. Go, like, it's <laughs> gonna start, it's gonna start if there's a financial, if you have anything on the line that involves your livelihood that's tied up into it, then you better be willing to hustle. Because there's no, there's just no other way. So. You know, getting out and asking people on the circuit about their experience as entrepreneurs, I mean, that, that's great and all,
but I can tell you a million different things about the early days, and some of them are anecdotally kind of funny because they're just were so miserable for me, and that's funny, right? But when it boil, what it boils down to is that you've got to do it your way, and your way, the only way to do it is to is to do it. That that's yeah. it, and and it's a, it's the work. It's not oh I've got some great idea and I'm just going to sort of you know it's just going to make me a million dollars, right? It's it's the work, day in and day out. Yeah, I'll sharpen that point just a little bit and say part of the work means being able to ask your customers for money. I think that's a huge, huge yeah. hump for people to go over is they'll spend years trying to perfect their product or perfect their offering or, or their perfect website. their website. Or their website. I and they're did like, that, man. You know, they're filing for their LLC and they're spending a lot of time on their website and they're doing all these things which are, you know, basic. Take cash, just hustle. Yeah, like, and there's a couple reasons for this. <laughs> One, there is nothing harder in the early days, but more sort of beneficial than asking people for money and learning how to sell what you have to offer, getting comfortable with rejection, getting comfortable getting out there, offering your product or service, and seeing if you can get people to buy it. That gives you a lot of really important feedback, by the way, about whether it's worth anything to people, you know, all of that stuff. So you gotta get over the hump and you gotta start selling something early even if it's not perfect. That's a big, big thing that most people put off, I think, way too long in the cycle. But the other thing that that does for you is it really changes everything. And if you've ever started a small business or if you've ever been in sales, you know what I'm talking about. Asking someone for the business and then them saying yes and like seeing that like PayPal transaction or whatever happens on your website. It's like that like, scene in Tommy Boy. Dude, it's amazing. <laughs> it is a, it's an amazing feeling. And if you've never experienced that, I wish it for you. You should start a lemonade stand or something just so you can have that like dopamine hit or whatever happens there <laughs> biologically. But it changes everything. So as you're like, you know, perfecting the business for, this is why they say engineers should never decide when products launch because it will never be ready. Yeah. Right? You got to get it out there and ask people for the business and try to sell your, your product or service and get used to failing a little bit because when you get those first couple of yeses and you see that first, you know, whatever, 50 or 100 or $1,000 transfer over to your account, you're like, this is a real thing. It is a huge deal. It changes everything. And it's hard for me to even describe how it happens, but it is a big Yeah, big so deal. Let, me, let me take the, the next part of that, which is the nightmare part of that. Because you start out and you say, okay, great, all my mom's friends bought a bag, right? You know, or, or the couple that weren't completely off put by a $295 bag, right? <laughs> my couple of my dad's friends buy a bag, right? Because, you know, maybe gave some family and friends discounts back in the day. Yeah. I did, <laughs> right? And I still do. Friends of Gilroy. We, we still do. I got a right? couple of those back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the point is, is eventually all of that goes away. All of your immediate circle. I mean, there was a time in, in the early days when I could go on to the GORUCK Facebook page and I knew every single person personally that liked GORUCK. Yep, been there. And, and so, you know, that expires at a certain point. I mean, it, you need to ride that as long as you can because if, you're, if all your friends, if you, first off, if you don't believe in your product, not going to work. Right. If you can't sell it, then why is anyone else going to jump on yeah. and like throw their weight I mean, behind it? Like you got to believe in it. Like, can you imagine if I'm trying to sell you a GR1 of sorts and I and I am wearing some, you know, North Face bag that's just going to you know disgusting and going to just fail like they always do, right? That's not going to work, right? Well, why don't you just wear your own and be like, oh, mine's way tougher, but you know, and like start hedging? No, like you you you. You own your own stuff. You own your product. You love it. You make sure that you, you know, don't don't go into sales for some company as just a, a mercenary. Believe in the product, or else yeah. you're going to apologize gone for the soon. price. That's the other one though. Like yeah. I had, I had a, a, it was a long time because like, grew up not particularly well off and have been accused of being you know, frugal at times <laughs> by my wife, <laughs> and. Um, that's a cheap SOB, that yeah, Wayne Smith. And, I've heard that. <laughs> and it, it took me a long time to ask people for the value that what I was offering was worth. You know, I spent a lot of time, you know, unfortunately kind of apologizing for the price of things. And like, look, if you set the price of something and you're determined that it's worth that, then you can say, look, GR1, best bag on the market, how much does it cost? $295. Don't blink. That's what it costs. And it's worth every penny of it, I swear to God. And if you start saying, well, it's... It's $2.95 and I know that's really expensive, but you know, it comes with some of these features. Like you've already lost. Yeah. 
you know, you'd be able to, you need to be able to look people in the eye. And also another thing that I talk about with my wife a lot is she's, she's a coach, like she's a, like in, the, in the fitness and the wellness space. And it costs kind of a lot of money to work with her. And it's worth every single penny. And it's a lot of her time and effort. And, you know, we've talked a lot about like, hey, stop apologizing. Stop automatically giving people discounts just because like you don't feel comfortable asking for Are their money. Are you saying there's right? no Black Friday sales? There's no Black Friday sales. That's, that's <laughs> the new thing this year. <laughs> Everything's full price because it's worth it. <laughs> yeah, but it, but in all seriousness, it's like, look, you gotta you gotta be able to send the email, send the proposal, look them in the eye, and say, hey, this is what I'm offering you. It's fifteen hundred dollars, because because it's worth that. And I think a lot of people struggle when they start a small business in being able just to, to charge enough. I think most people are charging not enough for their services. Yeah, and also there's two great answers in the world: yes and no. Maybe of any kind is is the worst. So whether it's you know. You're on the circuit passing out cards and someone's stringing you along because they're going to help you, give you your big break, right? And just sort of, you know, you have to keep sending email after email mm -hmm. after email. I mean, I get them. I don't know. I wish they would stop finding my email address, but, you know. It's you know, pretty easy. Person, I'm not going to give it out, but it's person, pretty easy. <laughs> person, I'm going to have to change it now. Person, you know, such and such from such and such companies got some great idea that's going to increase ROI by a factor of a thousand. I, I see it all the time. I always... I don't open it. LinkedIn. I click on spam. I'm blown up on no, LinkedIn all the time. LinkedIn is not, it's not connected. Anyway, so <laughs> I click on spam and I, if it's not unsubscribe or what, how, however I make sure I don't get those emails anymore, that, that makes me happier. You know, I forget where I was, I, I got so mad you thinking know about them and I forgot where I was But those salespeople were at least going out there and trying <laughs> to sell their hustling. business to you. Yeah. You know, at least they're hustling. I mean, if, if they showed up with a case of beer, you know, and uh, I, mean, you know, don't, I, can, I think I can finish the point. I think I know the point you're trying to make, which is that uh, the maybes mm. are kind of no good. They're basically no's. They're just not yet. They're not, a maybe is probably not a not yet. It's probably more likely a no that someone's just trying to be nice to you. And this is one of the, yeah, the important but hard lessons right. that I learned when I got out of the army and I was in like the knife fight that is sales, which was a, a, I, I needed to learn what a closed deal meant. Because I would go to somebody and they would say, yeah, no, sounds good. Let's do it. We'll set something up. And I'd be like, woo, I just closed the deal, you know, but I hadn't really. A closed deal means like there's ink on the contract. Mm -hmm. The first transaction has taken place. Like you're officially doing business together. That's a closed deal. And I spent, you know, I learned pretty quickly, fortunately, but I would see some of my- Self-preservation being a powerful motivator. Yeah, that's the interesting about sales. When you're working on commission, yeah. like you have this great benefit to actually close business and, and have money change hands. But I had a lot of, like my fellow sales reps, so especially the new ones, they would go through training and they'd be all psyched up and they'd get out there and they'd start talking to accounts. And some people aren't good at saying no. In fact, most people aren't very good at looking in the eye and saying, you know what, thank you for coming out and giving your sales pitch today, but we're just, we're going to stick with who we have or we're not going to go with you. Most people aren't good at that. So they give you some wishy-washy kind of feel good answer like, yeah, thanks for coming out. This looks good. You know, we're, we're definitely going to take a look at this. We, we're probably going to do it. But then they're not. They're not. Like a closed deal. It's not. This is happen. another, I mean, this is a bit of a sidebar, but it's actually a pretty good tip for like new small business owners or entrepreneurs is that closed business means contract is signed, transactions are taking place, and you're in there. If you're just handing out business cards and people are like, yeah, we'll definitely have coffee sometime. We'll do this. Like, Oh, but realize if you, if, if you have a website and they do actually give you your money, you still have to ship them their thing. It's not, the, the, the loop you have is to not, deliver on the, the loop is not closed until yeah. you actually ship it out. So <laughs> that's another part of it. <laughs> yeah. So there's, I guess there's only one other bullet on the board over here that I want to make sure that we get to, which is about kind of like brand building. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of people that want to start a business, they immediately think about selling things to other consumers. You know, they want to start a shoe company, they want to start a bag company, they want to start an app. It's all about kind of business to consumer. And that makes sense. Like all of our favorite brands, whether it's like Doritos chips or our favorite kind of beer or whatever. Beer you know, flavored beer. Beer flavored beer. Yeah, none of this also, pinky out, blueberry, wine cooler. These are all beer flavored beers. You're welcome to check them out. A beer. That's not beer, that's wine cooler, right? <laughs> beer flavored beer. I'm going to go ahead and right now and we're going to tease. At some point, we're going to have the beer show. <laughs> and we're going to have it from Fly's Tie, which is one of the great dive bars of Jacksonville yeah, Beach. It's awesome. And uh, we'll, we'll talk in much greater detail about beer. We'll sample some. It'll be great. So stay tuned for the beer show coming up. But I think the point I was trying to make is that 
I think most of us default to trying to create a product or a service that's like sold to consumers. You know, it's, it's a new kind of healthy chip. It's a new kind of this. You know, we all watch Shark Tank, you know, and it makes sense. But you know, the vast majority of commerce in America in any given year is business to business. So I think you should consider what is it? it? Yeah. The vast majority. Yeah. Like what's a huge... We don't have a fact checker on the show, so we can't get that. What's a huge B2B transaction? Uh, so like uh, banking services, financial services, um, lots of uh, like Cisco Foods. Here's a, here's a good one, right? So Cisco Foods, you guys have all seen okay. those trucks they drive around. They sell the food to restaurants with the restaurants then cook up and sell to you. So, you know, you could Don't start... eat at those places, by the way. <laughs> That's not where you want to eat. So it's been frozen since 1962. Wedge and restaurant. restaurant. <laughs> yeah, you know, they, the restaurant's too lazy, can't be bothered, right, to go to the, to go shop. So they just they Cisco just sends it. It's like might as well just eat an MRE. <laughs> okay. So that's <laughs> now you understand Jason's feelings about chain restaurants. But I believe in providing value. To, to the individual customers. I, yeah. So this whole B2B thing, I'm, I'm like, I'm Ronan, the you're guy. Gonna, you're cutting me short on my B2B uh, thing? But this is a really good idea. I, but I'm the guy sitting here saying, that sounds like a terrible idea to go into. Okay, so B2B sounds to me horrible. Well, it might be for you, but like, okay, so I'll, I'll offer two different sides of this. Working with customers and building a brand is exciting, but it's also super hard. And anyone out there who's done it, um, you know, this is kind of the sort of second brand I've been a part of. It is really hard because every single person, when you're building a really strong brand, every single customer, every member of your brand has a vote and a say so in how it goes. And as it should be. Just check Facebook. But we could, yeah, but we could go on, we could have a whole separate show about how demanding it is to answer all the emails, to answer all the Facebook comments, to like to be transparent, to be good to people. And I'm not suggesting you shouldn't do those things, but the bottom line is building a brand Building a business to consumer brand is super, super hard. So if you think you're gonna just like be the next Tom's or be the next GORUCK even, it is incredibly hard and probably a lot harder than you think. All I'm suggesting is there are a lot of opportunities to provide services to businesses. They probably have a budget for it anyway. And you, if you can make a business's life better, if you can help them make a little bit more money or save a little bit of money, there are a lot of opportunities out there that just aren't obvious to you because you don't see those kinds of things going on. It's a little bit behind the scenes. I'll give you a concrete example. There's a guy right here in Jacksonville. His name's Joe Padlow. He's a Marine Corps veteran. He's a Team RWB guy. And he started a business doing commercial cleaning. And he, he hires veterans and they go out and they clean office buildings, restaurants, you know, stuff like that. And he's running a, a really good business. Not sexy. But, but his business cycle is he goes around to businesses and office buildings and these kinds of places that need to have their place cleaned every night or mm -hmm. once a week or whatever it is. That's something that has to happen. They're, gonna, they're are automatically going to pay to do it to somebody. And he's going to them and saying, look, I have the most reliable people. I only hire veterans. We're going to deliver a great service to you. And they're crushing it. Like he's really growing That's awesome. that business because he found a, a pain point. He found a problem which was businesses were having a hard time getting reliable people to come in in the middle of the night and do a great job cleaning up and, and make their business look sparkling and, and awesome so that when their customers come in the next day, mm -hmm. the, the customer's having a great experience. So you might not think about that, obviously, it's really behind the scenes, but he's doing a better job because he's out hustling and outperforming the other people that were in that space before him. So I, it's just something to look at and consider. So when anything. you were at Team RWB, did you guys focus I mean, I know, I know you did both, but in, in fundraising efforts, which, by the way, money is oxygen for a business. So cash business, is king. Yeah, you have to have anything. It. If if I've had to learn that the hard way, because I sort of I'm not really motivated by money. I like the sort of uh, like beer. Yeah, I like beer. I like making sure we have enough money to, you know, have beer in the fridge. But yeah. you know, other than that, I, I like to work hard. Whatever, right? So. I mean, were you, what was the, what was sort of harder or easier about raising money from individuals versus, you know, say Wounded Warrior, they've got tons of individuals, they've got a big brand, mm -hmm. right? A recovering brand, by the way, Mike Lennington's awesome, yeah. their, their CEO, but they get a ton of money from individuals paying, what, 19 bucks a month or something? Yeah. And, and then 
you know, you, you also, from TMRDBV being smaller, you had to go after sort of B2B transactions of sorts, yep. right? So big donors. So what's the, what's the difference? Because GoRuck doesn't really do B2B at all. Uh. We, we do B2C only. So it was, in, in the nonprofit space especially, you can sort of see the way this plays out, but they both kind of have their pros and cons. So I would say, you know, if you're doing fundraising or a kind of B2C, right, you're getting a small amount of money from a, from a big number of individual <laughs> contributors, in some ways, that's easier in the sense that if someone's giving you $19, especially like a charitable cause or a good you know, cause that they believe in, they're probably not asking for a whole lot in return. They're kind of saying like, look, I believe in you. I love what you're doing. I, I appreciate what you're doing for veterans. You can have my 19 bucks a month or my $100 at the end of the year or whatever. And you know, we still feel very accountable to those people. But th that cash is nice because you can apply it to whatever the organization needs at the mm -hmm. time. Right, so that kind of money, and I, I think Wounded Warrior does over 100 million a year in kind of these individual, comp, you know, contributions, which is awesome for their ability to run their business. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. The mechanism to do that though takes some work and it takes some money. I mean, you've got to have kind of a marketing and a fundraising yeah. mechanism to get out there to do that. So that is that is actually very hard to set up. Once the contributions are coming in, they're a little bit lower stress. You know, when you start looking at Big, getting bigger chunks of money from foundations, corporations, you know, uh, the philanthropic arm of big companies like Walmart or Nike or Starbucks, you know, they might give you 100 or 200 grand at a pop, which is nice, but they're, they're going to restrict those funds a little bit more. And it's going to be a lot more of an onerous process, not just in working up to the donation. It might take you months or years. At TMRWB, it took us years to get to where Walmart ever gave us a dollar you know, literally two, two and a half years of going to meetings, talking with them, making proposals. But then when they give you the money- and By the way, you're paying for your own plane flights and stuff. Oh yeah. Oh, you are? Yeah, and sharing- And had to sharing, come out of money that you'd raised right. elsewhere? El yeah, Imagine yeah. that. Sharing crappy hotel rooms and you know, all <laughs> that stuff, right? But the old crappy hotel room by the airport, you know? <laughs> but they also then, like, there's a lot of reporting and procedures and things, and they might say, hey, we, we'll give you this money, but we want it to go toward this specific portion of your mission and that kind of thing. So yeah. getting the small chunks from a lot of individuals is nice. And it's kind of the same with GoRuck. Like all of our individual customers, the members, the GRTs out there, we give them a pretty big voice. Like we pay very close attention to what they want and what they need. But it's a, it's a large number of kind of individuals. We don't have any investors at GoRuck. So we've never taken any big chunks of money mm -hmm. from an individual or a venture capital firm or an angel investor or whatever. So we are not beholden to taking that big chunk of money and now we have to answer to them, answer their calls, answer their emails, do business in a way that's sort of satisfactory to them. Nonprofits are, are not that much different. If you're taking a big chunk of money from any investor, they're gonna have, they're gonna expect to have a little bit more say so in what you're doing and you're gonna have to answer their emails, or, write them or, reports, all that stuff. Or in our case, which would be you know, more likely is get some big customer. Someone wants you right. know, a recurrent, someone wants us to run a whole event series and it ends up being worth a lot of money or something, then yep. you have to hire people up to do that. And then if that all of a sudden starts to not work or the partnership fails, then, you know, that yeah. sucks. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really hard. So in some ways, building a brand is incredibly hard and it's time consuming and it's painful because I don't know about you, but every time I get an email from a customer or from a member that's had a bad experience, like it just, freaking burns a hole in my Every stomach. Every other year, you know? Yeah, and then like, <laughs> yeah. Because we do such a nice job here, but <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it tears me up. Like I lose sleep at night over like one single bad review of a Go Ruck Challenge or one customer pinging me on Twitter saying like, I don't understand this, this is BS, what are you gonna do about it? Like, yeah. I'm, I get to stuff like that because it, it matters a lot to me. So it's, it's really, really hard. I would say in the case of, of our business in particular though, it's far, far preferred than having one or two or three or 10 bigger customers or bigger investors that demand an even larger say so in what we're doing. Because what I found with our, with our GRTs and with our customers is that like, if you can say no with a smile, if you can offer, if you can let them be heard, if you can give them an honest answer, if you can be candid and direct and, you know, and timely in your response, like most people are pretty reasonable. Some people are unreasonable and like, Hey, if you're unreasonable, I'm sorry, that's your problem. Yeah. But most people I've, I've found are reasonable. And if you get back to them and you say, hey, sorry about this, I'll do this for you, or what you're asking for, I actually can't do for you, but whatever. Like, 
it's, it's really not that bad. Yeah, you set a bar really high, and if you don't meet it and someone calls you on it, then it's all about how you handle it. I mean, my grandfather had this thing. He would show up to dinner, and, you know, a after my mom would talk to the waitress and say, hey, the wine needs to come out really fast, <laughs> and just realize that, you know, all of your transactions with him need to be very communicative and very specific, and if something's going to be too long, you just need to let him know. And you None know, of that has made its way to you, though, which is interesting. <laughs> he, he was very straightforward, you know, but he had really high expectations for a, a, any business, any restaurant that he would walk into. It was just he had really high expectations. That's why he, he was well, or, I mean, he, would, eh, he was welcome at a lot of businesses in Ohio, but he would only really go to dinner at two or three places because they just knew him, right? How many places do you go to dinner at regularly in, in Jack's Beach, Jason? Uh, none. <laughs> Well, that, the number is small. That's a product of the kids. <laughs> no, so too. take the kids out of it. How many? Pose. Pose is awesome. Pose is my go-to. Okay. Uh. Not many though, right? <laughs> You've narrowed the field. North Beach Fish Camp occasionally. M, M likes North Beach, North Beach Fish Camp. Probably a Your little wife? more than I do. Wife my wife Emily place? likes North Beach Fish Camp a little, a lot. So. Yeah, not not a lot. Do you find it hard now as someone who has run a business for? the better part of a decade. I, I struggle with this. Every business I go in now, I start thinking about the business. I do. Like not just like your grandfather having high expectations, but I'm, I'm thinking about like, what's like the, you know, what's the revenue per customer in this place? Like, what, I wonder what kind of margins they're making here. Like so, I can't turn it off anymore. So I don't ever think about, well, not ever, but I don't really think about the business part of it. I usually think about the things that they don't care about. And I wonder why the they customer don't care service about. experience so, part of so it. So for instance, Pose. When you walk into the bathroom at Pose, there it's it's a themed restaurant based on it's like Edgar an experience Allen in the Poe, bathroom, yeah. right? And you walk in there, and there's there's sort of you know the Raven pages plastered. It, this is not some some wallpaper company that just said, "Hey, we've just got stock of this." It doesn't exist. Someone took the time to take the Raven and turn it into wallpaper in the bathroom. I'm like this is a place that cares. They care about the, the customer experience. They care about... Well, they have like know. the voiceover too. They have like the Edgar yeah. Allan Poe voice Edgar reading Allen the poem while you're peeing. reading you. Yeah. Reading to you while you're peeing. I mean, this is a place that cares about the details. It's awesome. Yeah. And so, and you know, burgers it's, are little, good too. it's little stuff like that that I'll go into place and say, they, they just don't care. And so, if a place doesn't care, then it makes me think that they don't care about their product. So, you know, if, if one little thing is wrong, it's like if you see one cockroach, there's a thousand. That's just how it is. And so, you know, nobody's ever going to be perfect in reality. And there's this, this part now that's sort of worn off on the wall where the, the, the poem is, you know, you can't read it quite as well as you used to. And they haven't fixed it yet. You know, it's a bit of a problem. You all notice pose. It's a bit of a problem pose. <laughs> you know, but the point is, is that, you know, you have to pay attention to all those details. So that's what I think of when I go into places. Or, or how could you possibly serve this at your place when it tastes this bad, right? Your menu, your menu is four football fields long, right? <laughs> Cheesecake Sir, factory. Just, if, you, if I walked into here and you said, we serve this, this one thing, and we're proud of it and we do it really well, I'm in. Bring it, right? But when you've got a football field of, of things and I order something, I mean, the, it's, so there's this great little place in Arkansas that I rolled up to. It's a burger barn or something. It's in the Ozarks. And I rolled up and I go, so what's good here? He goes, that's why we have a menu, right? I'm like, that's the kind of restaurant <laughs> I want to eat at, you know? And it was awesome. And so... Did you get like coleslaw on a burger or something like that? That's like Ozark, was, Northern Arkansas. It was fries and a burger. I hate uh. coleslaw, but... <laughs> But uh, hate it. Using the word hate. We have to have a restaurant right. show at some point. Or maybe we've already <laughs> had using it. Using the word hate about coleslaw. Strong right? word. Even like Asian slaw? It's a little spicy. I don't know. I, the American slaw has completely turned me <laughs> off. And, you know, not a I didn't guy. have a... What about I, vinegar slaw? Have you ever had vinegar I slaw? I did not have a favorable experience with food in China. So I'm kind of... In, and I will not eat pho again and unless I have to go back to Vietnam, unless I get to go back to Vietnam. Vietnam's awesome. That's a real but shame. I will not be eating pho in America. There's a good pho place right here in... Uh, uh, there's Beach. a great pho place. Right? It's also known as pho. But it's pho. pho. It's, it's called pho. I learned it. So in Vietnam, they have, they have restaurants. They might as well just call them pho. Because right? so that's what you get. It's breakfast, you get pho. It's lunch, you get pho. It's dinner, you get pho. So you eat that a lot. Okay, first of all, you need it. Because I, 
I've heard a little <laughs> about your trip to Vietnam, which I was very sad not to be able to make, but there was a reasonable amount of beer consumed. Actually, not a reason. An unreasonable amount of beer was consumed on the trip, and pho is one of the best hangover foods of all time. So you're welcome. The Vietnamese no. people no. did you some justice. The, but the best hangover food is another beer. Hair of the dog, Lane. Hair of the dog. So at, at our house, <laughs> if we're a little hungover, which is almost never. Whose house? The house that I live at with my wife. Oh. Um, she will say, <laughs> I'll say, look, this is, this is painful. Do you want to get some pho? And she says, fuck yeah. Yeah. That's how we do it. So, That's great. hey, do we have time for questions, Bomber, before we go totally off the rails here? <laughs> yeah, I've got some good ones today. Yes, good questions. Let's do it. I have no idea what this means, but it sounds cool. Jordan Woods says, how did you move from, how did you move Bill Rudd from the early adopter phase to the current adopter mm. phase? Would you say the challenge was the key to getting past that traditional business issues? So Jordan Woods said, he's basically talking about Crossing the Chasm, which is a great book written about business, but he's, he's asking whether... Uh, I think how you've we read got more business books than I have, Blaine. Yeah, uh, probably. <laughs> Most of them weren't that good. Um, <laughs> how GoRuck went from the early adopter phase, which is like sort of the new, really energetic people that just like love it and they're gonna do it because they're just gung ho. Have we to, moved from that to the current? <laughs> Actually, you know what? Maybe that's a better question. Have we gone from kind of the early adopter phase where like people are just like really gung ho about rucking and GoRuck, or you gotta have to like cross the gap into or the chasm into kind of like early mainstream people were like, I, th I think we have actually, I think there are a lot okay, of sort I mean, of mainstream I live my, people. I live my life as if, I live my life at GoRuck as if I'm surrounded by the early adopter phase still. So, I mean, I, I think about the people that do our events that, that want to really push themselves to the next level of whatever they want to do in life and GoRuck is a part of that. Those are the people that I think about the most in terms of how GORUCK should operate and act and, and the responsibilities that I have to them. And, and so I think that, you know, I, I guess a, a smarter business person could talk about what all the metrics and the numbers mean as far as size and scale and stuff. But I, my best guess is that when you create a raving fan base that tells other people about what they got, and in GORUCK's case, the experience that they, that they had or that they got, then in GORUCK's case, you know, I've said forever, hits equal sales. So if, if more people spread more awareness, then ultimately all roads lead to Rome, or in this case, GORUCK.com. And if you read the reviews on GR1, they're, they're pretty good, you know? They're yeah. pretty good. So some percentage of those people are gonna buy a ruck or buy some other stuff, which is of the same quality standard a, as GR1. So, you know, I, I don't I don't know how to dissect the business side, but that's sort of the you know hits equal sale. You, basically, going back to the what we talked about before is is solve a problem for people, and they'll probably love you for it. And if you don't worry too much about how to be something you know that that looks good, like just do more of what feels right, what what is right, and mm -hmm. you know more people will will follow. What's up next? Yeah. I, I, hey, hang on. Quick, I'll, I'll, I just want to like really reinforce this because I've only been inside the wire here for you know much less time than you have, and I would say every every single thing we do, like the the photos and the stuff that goes on the website, like all the marketing copy, it's always like if it gets a little bit too no offense, but if it gets a little too hipster, like if we start trying to appeal to some people that might be buying our stuff but aren't kind of our core group, like we'll pull it back and we just continue to appeal to. Like we call it Thrasher picks, you know, Thrasher, Rucking, Bar Ops. Yeah. Those, those, are, the, are, the those are the three pictures you're going to see on our social media, on our website, because that's what we care most about is Rucking first, Thrasher, which means like basically just exudes toughness, right? And then Bar Ops, which means you can take this awesome tough stuff and use it in regular life too. We've really throttled back even since I've been here on kind of the you know, the barista kind of urban stuff. And it does, the rucks do well in that environment. And a lot of people that buy the rucks are in that kind of demographic. But we've really doubled down on, like, let's message against what these rucks are best for. And if they're good enough for a Go Ruck Challenge, if they're good enough for Baghdad, then they're certainly good enough for the software developer in San Francisco that's going to have some rainy, foggy days. And that seems to work for us. So we've actually just kind of doubled down actually and pulled back from like the expansion of the market and we've just like 
Yeah, I mean, gone if, deeper into if a Green Beret is going to travel from New York to San Fran, right, he's going to have a GR1, right? So, and I've done know. that for years. I can definitely attest to that too. Like, <laughs> I, the GR1 and the GR2, I've taken, well, the Rucker too, actually. I lived for eight weeks this summer out of a Rucker. Like, that's real life. And I was in all kinds of places. And I didn't look like a military guy for almost any of it. Yeah. But, like, we've really doubled down. I, I mean, think, the, on wig, that the, the blonde wig and stuff probably helped with that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, what's next? Hey, what is your favorite non-ruck piece of go-ruck gear? Ooh, favorite non-ruck piece of go-ruck gear? All right, so this is, this is not like bullshit. The, ha the half zip is my favorite piece of kit that go-ruck has made that's not a ruck. Hmm. I'm wearing a blue one today, which I'm not even sure is available yet, but I have a black one. This week? Yeah, I think this week maybe. But I've, I have a black one that I wear almost every day. The temperatures have dropped below 70 degrees. In Jacksonville Beach. In the 50s Beach. this morning, it was freezing. Yeah, so it's in the 50s and 60s most days here. And whatever I'm wearing that day, I have my half zip in my ruck and I wear it. I, I don't want to talk about how long it's been since I've washed it, but I wear the half zip almost every day. It looks awesome. I wore it to like a networking thing a yeah. couple weeks ago and people actually complimented on it, even though they were all wearing ties and stuff. Yeah. Like by far best piece of kit we have, I think, um, outside of the rucks. But I don't know. There's there's a lot of competition. Yeah. So, I I mean I I like the half zip. I like the the rucking shirt. But oh, simple the, the pants. pants. Simple I, I got pants. The pants on. Yes. God dang it. Yeah. I That's, got the pants on. So, I mean, I, I'm not gonna go into how often I do or don't wash stuff. Right. I've got a lot of pairs. He claims stuff. to have a lot of pairs. I'm pretty sure he's wearing the same pair. Like I five got days a lot of week. pairs. Right. <laughs> you you can you can come to my house, Blaine. You're always welcome. I'll show you all my pairs. Right. <laughs> Not a problem. No, simple pants and simple shorts. But maybe yeah. even better than half zip. Yeah. So, I mean, so we took the the blue jeans, the 501s. I'm a 3436 in Levi's 501 blue jeans. Took the patterns ish for those and made them out of a fabric that you can actually do stuff in, which is awesome. So yeah. I, I, love, I wear them every day. I, I'm, I'm still shocked that I don't wear blue jeans anymore. And, and then I, yeah. every once in a while, I think, oh, I should wear a pair of blue jeans just to sort of, it, it, just to sort of remember what the pain felt like, except I've become nostalgic <laughs> about the pain, right? And so then I wear the blue jeans and then I try to put my leg over the top of my bike, right? To get on my bike. Cause I got, you know, I got the kid thing on the back, right? It's awesome. And, and uh, I can't sort Very of get, domestic, I yeah. can't get my leg over it. And it's not because of a lack of flexibility because my proof that I'm flexible enough is the fact that when I wear my simple pants, it's no problem. Right. <laughs> we so went to a concert. That was easy. Where did we, Avid Brothers. We went to see Avid Brothers <laughs> a few weeks ago and I wore <laughs> yeah, jeans because like, good show. because my wife dressed up really nice. She looked beautiful. <laughs> and I was like, well, you've done, you've done, you know, you've done the work. You look amazing. I'm going to put on a nice pair of jeans and like a button down shirt and I wore them and I was like, these are terrible. <laughs> I wore them anyway, but I was like, and I wore like leather shoes, I think too, which yeah. simple pants, Chuck Taylors all day, every day, or Vans, Chuck oh. Taylors or Vans, that's it. Uh, Jessica Martin was wanting to know, what is the best piece of advice that you give to someone in the early stages of a new business? Ooh, best piece of advice to someone in the early stages. I guess that means of, of a new business. I guess that means they've already started it. That's a, that's a broad question. So, my, it's really hard to know, Jessica, without knowing like what business you're in, but what I would say for almost everybody is you've got to go find customers. Get, get knee Your website doesn't marketing. matter. No. Your business cards don't matter. Your ability to hustle to get customers, that's what matters. Right? I mean, that's your, the best I got. Without, your, without your more mom, details, your dad, I would say. Your brother, your sister, your cousins, all of their friends, everyone you know on Facebook, you know, can't just be terrible, but you know, you can't just sort of solicit them. Like, they don't owe you anything. So you've got to do it right, but you got to ask them for their money, whatever that looks yeah, like. Yeah, stop putting off asking for money. That's the biggest one. So hope that helps. We got more. What the monster? Yeah, What's up, buddy? Yeah, two more things. Uh, the only cadre that watch hmm. all consistently are Ragnar and Shredder. Shout out to them and Shredder. Ragnar and Shredder, great cadre. Come here, monster. Come on. Hey, come on. Which one's doing the drinking game? Ragnar or Shredder? Or both? So Ragnar's in Tampa, by the Don't way. If anyone's so in Tampa right now, Don't Cadre so Ragnar is there and he would love to have a beer with you. He'll even buy it for you. That's what he told me. So <laughs> go find Cadre Ragnar on Facebook. And, Probably and in the airport, hotel. A, dude, there's a lot. Got of, a case of Bud Heavy. 
in, in, a, in an ice bucket somewhere. Ragnar, Ragnar you know? is not a big butt heavy guy, <laughs> as you well know. Oh, no, he likes that Gucci pinky out <laughs> stuff, you know? So, so, so he comes by it, honestly. So Ragnar was my company commander. Uh, well, he, sorry, he was the company commander right before I showed up at, at 10th Group. And, I mean, that guy was just loved. I mean, the guys just absolutely loved him. And so the, the fun part for me was that it took GORUCK so that I actually met him. And so we, we met face to face and it tweeted a couple notes. He's an ambassador for the GBF, which by the way, we raised over a hundred and some, probably 120 getting, something K for yeah. GBF. I think no, it's, we didn't, you guys raised you guys did. over 120 grand for GBF. We're, we'll cut them a check here once we finish kind of crunching the numbers, but well done. You guys put in a lot of miles. You raised a lot of money, over 120 grand for yeah. Green Bray Foundation. Which is awesome. And, and Ragnar, Phil, uh, is a, an ambassador for them as he well. Did, he so did like five or 10 grand on his own. Uh, yeah, but that's uh, through some separate, separate right? Yeah. But so I'd, I'd seen him around and then it took GORUCK to sort of actually meet him face to face. So he's one of our cadre. He's awesome. And we, we hiked a mountain in, uh, in, in Montana for the, all the GR3 picks. So you'll see some, some pictures of him in the half sip, actually, the, the black the one. the knife and the He's sausage. got the knife and the sausage. And yeah. So I'm actually working on a story for the GR3, which I don't know, I think it's probably gonna be early December before that ships out, but that's sort of, you know, like still rumor stage. We promised December, we promised this year, so we'll, we'll deliver on that. Uh, but we ended up hiking up a mountain and it was all the sausage and all the beer. So that's how we like to go hike, right? You get up top, there's no, there's no store up there for you to go buy all your stuff, you know? You're like, what do you want when you get to your campsite at the top of a mountain? I want all the sausage and all the beer. It's awesome. That's the kind of adventure that GR3 afforded us. So we got to do that together, two guys that had been Green Berets and Alpha two, uh, A210 Special Forces Group way back when. So that was awesome. And, you know, the Go Ruck ride is a good one. Brings us, brings us lots of good people. Well, I'll double down on that one too. I, um, I spent the last five years working on behalf of veterans and getting to know a lot of veterans. And I've always said that I, I love them all equally. I have to, I want to, it's been awesome. But there's something truly special about being with other, other Green Berets. And one of the things I've loved about making the move over here is to have more opportunities to spend more time with other SF guys, other special ops guys, like, you know. It's at, like someone at, from your hometown at, or something. I don't want here, anyone to feel you know? less loved because I love everyone equally. But there's something good about being able to go drink some beers or go out to lunch with five or six SF guys. And uh, for this, me, this has afforded me more of an opportunity to, like, spend more time in the community I came from, and that has been big for me personally, so I've enjoyed that. It fills that. the tank up a little bit, you know? Yeah, not, I don't have to do it every day, Yeah. but like, it's, it's big. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. One more thing, just a shout out to Mark Otto and the Rut Club who just showed up in New York. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, huge shout out to Mark Otto. Monster is like, hey, Mark Otto, this is for you. <laughs> <laughs> so Mark Otto was responsible for, for <laughs> getting a ton of veterans, a ton of GRTs, Ruck clubs from all over the country in the Veterans Day Parade in New York City. And all anyone wants to talk about is how cold it was, which I guess it was. I don't know. I was down Get here tougher, in Florida. Get tougher, people. Yeah, Come on. Ne next year I'll be there. Right? But, but it, was, it was pretty <laughs> awesome to the see. the guy that wore the sort of like, like backcountry hunting jacket on his walk in 60 degree temperatures this morning. Me. <laughs> all right, next year I'll be there. But um, that, it was amazing to see like 200 GRTs walking in the New York City Veterans Day Parade. Rucking. Rucking, yeah. Not, not just walking in the parade, rucking in the parade. And as I understand, they had to be there super early and sit out in the cold because all their rucks had to be inspected and like bomb dogs sniffed and stuff. Yeah. But they braved the cold, had an awesome time, huge turnout. Um, Mark Otto, thanks, man. You're, you're doing uh, yeoman's work. Thank you. Awesome stuff. All right. Any last words about the title of the stuff, title of the day? Yeah, so if Can you want to start a business, yeah, don't start a business unless you're, you're, you're comfortable being poor for a while and you're willing to take the long play. Don't start a nonprofit unless you're willing to do both those things doubly. And uh, if we can help in any way, email Jason. Yeah. And I would say to that end, if, if you want to start a business or, or do anything like that, really come up with a list of a thousand reasons why you should not do it. And sit on that for a little while and if you can sort of convince yourself otherwise that it's still a good idea and maybe even 
ask all your friends then and ask them to add on to the list. Maybe you get like 10,000 reasons why you should not do it. And if you still in your heart, if you still in your heart just cannot imagine not doing it, then, then go for it and give it all you got. And that's the only way that, that's the only way you can do it. And if you do that, then you believe in yourself, then you can, you can absolutely make it happen. Yeah, because it doesn't get any less hard. It's still hard today, right? Maybe harder than it was 10 years ago? Yeah, more money, more problems. Ne never stops being hard. Yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> Says monster, peace. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>